Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our uh, plenary session this morning, uh, The Health Gap, The Challenge of an Unequal World. Um, it's my pleasure to be able to welcome you to uh, the session this morning. My name's Aaron Reeves. I'm uh, a research fellow here in the Inequalities Institute, International Inequalities Institute at the LSE. And I'd really just like to take an opportunity to thank as well the organisers uh, and the support staff of various kinds who've really put on, to my mind, a fantastic conference so far today. So. Uh, yesterday and, and I'm sure the rest of today. So I just want to introduce very briefly uh, the featured speaker, uh, Professor Sir Michael Marmot, who is Professor of Epidemiology and, and Public Health. He's going to be talking today about his, uh, his new book, oh, The Health Gap, which uh, is the title of our session. Uh, Michael will also be available to sign uh, books after the end of the session. We have a, a bookseller, an independent bookseller outside and uh, it would be great to take an opportunity to, to buy the book and, and do that. I can wholeheartedly recommend it. And really the, the book, I think, is um, a review of some of the recent developments in thinking about the social determinants of health and really ranges across uh, each of the kind of key areas that many of us are concerned about that are working in this space and provides a really excellent overview of some of the new innovations that are in that space. We also have two really exciting respondents, I think. So we have... Anita Charlesworth, who is Director of Economics and Research at the Health Foundation, which is a, a think tank that's focused um, a great deal on health systems and healthcare financing, but very recently has thought very carefully and consulted quite widely on thinking uh, on the social determinants of health. And so I think it'll be very interesting to have a sort of policy perspective, uh, poli uh, a think tank perspective on the work that, that Michael's presented. And then finally, um, Kate Pickett, who's Professor of Epidemiology, um, will provide, I think, a, a slightly more academic take uh, on the, uh, the work that's, that Michael presents to us today. So without further ado, uh, let's, will you join me in welcoming uh, Professor Michael Marmot. Thank you. When I was conducting the English review on health inequalities, which we published in 2010, set up in 2009, I invited John Hills to be a member of the commission. Uh, he said he'd love to do it, but he was conducting his own review of inequalities, and he said, you've got a tougher task than I have, he said. I just have to document what's going on. You've got to say why it matters. And it matters enormously. I was talking about my book in the US and I had written about health inequalities in Baltimore, Maryland. And a month after I was, a month before I was talking about the book, Baltimore erupted. The precipitant of the civil unrest in Baltimore was the killing of a black man in police custody or should I say, one more killing of a black man by the police. But the underlying cause was inequality. As I said, I'd been writing about Baltimore. It's slightly inaccurate to say that Baltimore erupted. One part of Baltimore erupted, Upton Druid Heights. The male life expectancy in that part of Baltimore was 20 years shorter than in the wealthiest part, Roland Park, 63 versus 83. I'd been at a meeting at Johns Hopkins University, which is in Baltimore, and a couple of young doctors said to me, you cannot sit here and listen to all this without seeing Baltimore. So we started in Roland Park, the nice leafy area where the professors live, grass, trees, very lovely. And then we ended up in the Upton Druid Heights area. There are streets in that area where every second house has a red cross, diagonal red cross on the door. It means that that house has been condemned as unfit for human habitation. If there's an emergency, the emergency services will not go in there. Can you imagine what it's like 
to live on a street where every second house has been condemned as unfit for human habitation. It's no accident that that's where the riots happen. If you have no stake in the future, you've got very little to lose by rioting. When the summer riots happened in 2011 in London, where did they begin? In Tottenham. I had been pointing out that Tottenham had the shortest life expectancy for men in Tottenham Green in London, 17 years shorter than Kensington and Chelsea. The riots didn't begin in Kensington and Chelsea, they began in Tottenham. And I don't think that ill health causes riots, and I don't think riots cause ill health, but I think inequality of social and economic conditions, lack of opportunities for the future, cause both ill health and civil unrest. And if we look a bit further into what it's like growing up in these two communities, in Upton Druid, LeSean, typical young man, Half the families are single parent families. Median household income in 2010 was $17,000. Kids do poorly in school. They miss a lot of school. 90% do not go on to college. Each year, a third of young people aged 10 to 17 were arrested for a juvenile disorder. One third each year. That means the chance of getting to age 17, there are some re-arrests of course, but the chance of getting to age 17 without having been arrested is quite small. Now, in theory, the slate is supposed to be wiped clean at 18, so you're 18, you go for a job, and you're asked, have you ever been in trouble with the police? You could lie, that's not a very good qualification for getting a job or you could tell the truth, and that's not a very good qualification for getting a job. Little wonder that anger boils over. And 2005 to 2009, 100 non-fatal shootings for every 10,000 residents, and nearly 40 homicides. Now, Roland Park, 93% two-parent families, median household income not 17, thousand dollars but ninety thousand dollars the kids do well in school they don't miss school 75 percent complete college juvenile arrests one in 50 not one third each year one in 50 no non-fatal shootings and four homicides not 40 per ten thousand one tenth i think these set of social conditions are intimately related to health as they are to the likelihood of civil unrest. But it's not just the poor. One of the key messages that I've had throughout my research life is the social gradient in health. Olshansky and colleagues pointed out that white men with low education have astonishingly poor life expectancy, but it's a gradient as it is for black men and black women and white women. The more years of education, the longer the life expectancy, and it's true for each race sex group. And Case and Angus Deaton published this, they said they were the first to notice the problem. I think Olshansky noticed it a bit before they did, but it helps if you've won a Nobel Prize for economics a few weeks before you publish it. And if you look at mortality age 45 to 54, in France, in Germany, in the UK, Canada, Australia, Sweden, dramatic falls. It's a lot higher in France than it is in Sweden. U.S. Hispanics and U.S. non-Hispanic whites. Not shown here, 
is the fact that that rise in US non-Hispanic whites was steeper progressively the lower the education. So the gradient is getting steeper. What were the causes of death? Number one, poisonings due to drugs and alcohol. Number two, suicide. Number three, chronic liver disease due to alcohol. Four, external causes of death. Wow. And in fact, I had written to Angus Deaton to congratulate him on his Nobel Prize, and he wrote back, uh, Angus and I had argued like anything because classic argument in economics, um, public health people like me, um, biased by our do-gooding intentions and our concern for health and well-being, think that social conditions influence health. What a radical idea. And of course, the standard economic argument is health determines your social conditions. So Angus and I had argued like anything over years about this issue. But when he wrote to me about this paper, he said, this will be grist to your mill. And to hear him talk about it, he said, incomes didn't go up for three decades. The jobs that these people did have all moved abroad. They had stable factory jobs. They've all moved abroad. I would add, as I'll show you in a little while, um, problems of early child development and education. And I would suggest the people who aren't dying in this group are voting for Donald Trump. They're, and if we're not careful in Britain, we're gonna move the same way. If we decide, as we seem to have decided, that our percent of national income spent in the public sector is gonna go from a typical European figure of maybe 45% down to 36%, and our services get worse, the jobs are going, the disaffection, and they're the Brexiteers. They're the Brexiteers. They're the people whose fears and uncertainties and anger are being cynically, I'm not a politician, why the hell am I saying this? They're being cynically manipulated by a bunch of unscrupulous politicians. I mean, it's no accident that, I mean, somebody, I, Michael, stop this. Um, <laughs> Somebody said to me the other day, um, for every economist who's in favor of remaining in the European Union, you can find one who's in favor of leaving. Therefore, you can ignore them. I said, that's simply not true. It's simply not true. Surveys show 82% of economists are in favor of remain. It's simply not true. For every five or six who are in favor of remain, you can find one who's in favor of leaving, possibly. It's just simply not true. And it's not true that for every historian in favor of Remain, there's one that's in favor of leaving. Not true. The overwhelming majority of historians, scientists. I, we published a letter in the Times this morning, former presidents of medical royal colleges and the BMA, overwhelmingly in favor of Remain. What I do in my day job is I go around the world and saying we've got common concerns that cut across national boundaries. And what we learn in one country is highly relevant to others. I'm concerned with health inequalities in Britain, and I'm talking about the United States, where we've just launched a new commission on equity and health inequalities in the Americas. What we've learned from Europe is highly relevant to the Americas. We need to cooperate and understand across borders. This is really upsetting, and I'm not political. <laughs> now, I'll try to get over my rant. Um, but the gradient idea I am keen on, which is that ill health is not confined to people in poverty and good health for everybody else, but it's graded. These are data from England. Each dot represents a small area classified by income deprivation. So at the right-hand end, as you look at it, 
we've got the most affluent and down there the most deprived. People near the top have shorter life expectancy than those at the top. People in the middle have shorter life expectancy than those near the top. It runs all the way from top to bottom. And if I were being mischievous and said, if you were of the perspective the, uh, that health determines your social position, not the other way around, it's quite remarkable. The people who've got just slightly bigger tendency to get sick choose to live in slightly less affluent areas. And so it goes. People are remarkably good at picking where to live based on their propensity to get ill. It's just terrific. Didn't realize people were so clever. Um, but I think a bit more likely is that the conditions where you live are impacting on your risk of getting sick. And we've got evidence overwhelmingly that points in that direction. The bottom graph is disability-free life expectancy. The gradient is steeper. It means that people at the top are living about 12 years of their lives with disability, and people at the bottom living about 20 years of their lives with disability. The dotted line was the earlier period, 1999 to 2003. The solid line is the later period, and you can see that Health's got better for everybody, but the gradient hasn't changed. The inequalities haven't changed. So health getting better for everybody is terrific, wonderful. Objective one, reducing inequalities, objective two, hasn't happened. So we can be really pleased. It's improved for everybody, but we've got a lot more work to do. And commonly in the US, I get asked, why should I care if this is about poor people getting sick? I'm not poor, so why should I care? So I say, look at the average. You're a 15-year-old boy. Go into a typical American school and count 100 boys like you. 13 of you will fail to reach your 60th birthday. Is 13 out of 100 a lot? Well, it's double the Swedish figure. It's higher than in most European countries. It's higher than in Costa Rica, Cuba, and Chile. In fact, there are 194 member states of the World Health Organization, and on this particular metric, the US ranks 50th out of 194. And this is not a healthcare issue. When I listed those causes before, poisonings, suicide, alcoholic liver disease. It's not primarily due to lack of access to health care. So it's something that affects everybody. And it's global. It's hard to get data on inequalities in adult mortality globally because they don't exist. Not the inequalities don't exist, the data don't exist. Um, but if we look at under five mortality by wealth quintile, Uganda, India, Turkmenistan, and what you see in country after country is the gradient. If you were in the second top wealth quintile in India, you wouldn't say, well, let's just care about the poor, don't care about me. You'd say, I think, why is the under five mortality in the second top quintile in India higher than in Bangladesh and higher than in the bottom quintile in Peru? The gradient means we've got to improve things for everybody, not just focus on the worst off, important as that is. I coined the rather ugly phrase proportionate universalism with the idea that universalism means we focus on everybody, universalist solutions, a health system for the poor is a poor health system. I think that probably came from LSE. Was that Richard Titmus who said that? Um, a health system for the poor is a poor health system. We want universalist solutions, but with effort proportionate to need. 
And if we look globally at the relation between wealth and health, the so-called Preston curve updated, this is income per person, GDP, at purchasing power parities, and life expectancy. And at low levels of life expectancy, there's a steep relation between income and life expectancy. So a small increase in national income is correlated with a large increase in life expectancy. But when you get up here to somewhere between 10 and $20,000 of purchasing power parities, there's simply no relation. You can go from Cuba and Costa Rica and Chile all the way up to Luxembourg with its own Panama Papers, and there's simply no relation between national income and life expectancy. And look here, you remember the poor in Baltimore had an income, household income of $17,000. The national income in Costa Rica adjusted to the American dollar of purchasing power is way below that, but life expectancy is much longer. That this is men and women together. If I just looked at men, uh, life expectancy for the poor of Baltimore was 63. For men in Costa Rica, something like 77, 14 years longer, at lower income. So globally, the poor of Baltimore are fantastically rich. Tell that to the young men on the street corner with no prospects for the future. So it's not just income. It's living conditions, it's social conditions, it's prospects for the future, which of course are correlated with income in rich countries, but it's not just absolute material conditions. Have I gone too long? Did I do my time? So what do we do about all this? I think we need to take a life course perspective. We start with giving every child the best start in life. Let me come back home, as it were. When we published the report of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health in 2008, I pointed to the fact that life expectancy for men in Calton, in Glasgow, was 54. And for Lindsay, a few kilometers away in Glasgow, it was 82, a 28-year gap. And in fact, I was at a meeting in Brussels and somebody came up to me and said, I'm from Lindsay. And I thought, that's not a surprise. Nobody from Calton would come to a meeting in Brussels. He said, I'm from Lindsay and I drink in the pub regularly with a friend from Calton. And the other night, I'm chatting to my friend, and it turned out he'd made no arrangements for his pension. And I asked him, why not? And he said, because I'm 54. <sighs> I said, I'm delighted that my research is being discussed in Scottish pubs, but the idea that it's destiny that he's 54, so he knows there's no point in planning for the future. What's it like? This case history, by the way, was brought to me by Chief Superintendent John Carnahan, who was the head of homicide in Strathclyde, in Glasgow. But he saw the light. He was asked at one point, would you like another 100 police officers on the beat? And he said, I'd rather have 100 health visitors investing in improving early childhood would do more to reduce homicide than having another 100 officers on the beat. So this is Jimmy, a single mother with a succession of male partners, each of whom abused Jimmy physically, if not sexually. He had behavioral problems by the time he got into school. As soon as he was old enough, he was labeled a delinquent. He'd been involved in gangs and violence never had a proper job. Any money he gets goes into drink and drugs. A diet of pub food, fast food, and alcohol. 
a series of short-term girlfriends, each of whom threw him out because of questions of alcohol-fueled violence. Just think for a moment, if you're of the perspective that says people are responsible for their own health, and if they're sick, it's because they don't listen to advice, and if only, could you imagine? Just do the thought experiment. Go into Carlton and say, Jimmy, pull your socks up. Stop doing drugs, lay off the booze, get a job, leave the gang, eat sensibly. I wish I could do a Glaswegian accent, but you could guess that the second word Jimmy would say to you would be off, <laughs> and you can imagine what the first word would be. Uh, I don't think that's a very helpful perspective to go, Jimmy isn't doing what he's doing because no one's told him that smoking damages your health. This is not ignorance. If Jimmy had a secure childhood and a decent education and life chances and then decided to goof off, that's up to Jimmy. That's not our business. But with this tragic life history, just simply saying, well, it's up to Jimmy, seems to me a bit short-sighted. And his life expectancy is eight years less than the Indian average. And we see this more generally. This comes from the 1970 British birth cohort. And it's looking at cognitive development following children from 22 months of age to 10 years of age. Look first at children in the 10th centile. and follow them, if they grow up in families of low socioeconomic status, they remain low. If they grow, grow up in families of high socioeconomic status, they catch up. There's regression to the mean, but that's not the whole explanation of what's going on here. Looking at children who are in the 90th centile of 22 months, if they grow up in families of high socioeconomic status, they remain high grow up in families of low socioeconomic status, they decline. Assume for the moment that all the differences at 22 months were biologically determined. Genes, birth trauma, things of that nature. And the differences associated with the socioeconomic status of the family are social. The social trumps the biological. But in fact, not all the differences at 22 months are biological. The quality of early nurturing and rearing really makes a difference. So the social environment of early childhood is having a huge impact on cognitive development, social, emotional, and behavioral development. And we've been monitoring this in England, and we look at the proportion of children age five who have a good level of development by deprivation of the local authority. So the mo more affluent on the right-hand end there and the more deprived on the left-hand end. I suggest in my book that this is a political litmus test. People on the right politically suggest it's poor parenting and people on the left suggest it's poverty and deprivation. And I suggest they're both correct, that the social circumstances in which parents are trying to be parents impacts on what they can do. There was, Jane, you'd be familiar with it, the book that was published in the US recently, $2 a day on cashless, uh, one and a half million cashless households. and what comes out of the case studies in this book. If you went to one of these single mothers essentially living in a cashless household in the US and said, you must read your child bedtime stories, her response might well be, if I had a bed, I'd read a bedtime story. Not just if I had a book, but if I had a bed. And you see what it's like for these single women working in the local supermarket who says, tomorrow you're on night shift. And she says, 
but I can't do that because I have no childcare arrangements. And they say, you're fired. And now she can't pay the rent. And they say, you're evicted. And we're talking about quality of parenting. Now that's the extreme, but it's a gradient. Oh, the other thing about this figure is this staggering thing to me that in our monitoring, the me median was 59%. In other words, in England, only 59% of children age five were classified as having a, a good level of development. And some people have said to me, I've said it to myself, there must be something wrong with the measure. How can it be in a brainy country like this one that just under 60% have a good level of development, 40% don't. Well, <coughs> chaps, uh, this is the UNICEF report card. There's the UK and the US in the early 2000s, and there's the late 2000s. Wow, we've done brilliantly, we're up to 16. Um, sorry about this, but the US still bumping along at the bottom. And when I think about that and Case and Angus Deaton figure of the rise in mortality in non-Hispanic whites with low education, I think about this poor quality of circumstances in early childhood. And if we look at uh, scores at reading and maths at age seven, so a little bit later in the UK, the more of these factors present, low birth weight, not being breastfed, maternal depression, lone parent, low family income, unemployment, maternal qualifications low, damp housing, social housing, and area deprivation, the more of those you have, the lower the reading scores and the lower the math scores. This will predict the future. Poor early child development, poor performance in school, not leaving school with good qualifications, not in employment, education, or training, low status job, low income, poor neighborhood, poor health, vote Brexit. <laughs> but we can do something about it. If we look at the child poverty, where poverty is defined as less than 60% median income, before and after taxes and transfers. Latvia, before social transfers, child poverty is 35%. Sweden, 32%. After taxes and transfers, child poverty is 25% in Latvia, and it's 12% in Sweden. They don't like child poverty in Sweden, Slovenia, or Norway, so they use the fiscal system to reduce it. Latvia, Poland, the United Kingdom, we're quite tolerant of child poverty, so we decide to use the fiscal system to make rich people richer, rather than to reduce child poverty. That's a political decision, we've decided, we live in a democracy, so presumably that's what we all want. Well, the 25% of us who voted for the government want. Um, I, I wrote a piece for Scientific American and I thought if I compared the US with Sweden, you know, Sweden sounds like some Marxist Leninist hellhole to Americans, um, it would get nowhere. So I compared the US with Australia. I thought Australia sounds a bit like Texas, uh, <laughs> well, or Southern California. And if you look at the figures I have, well, this is 60%. If you look at 50% median income, that child poverty in the US and Australia before taxes and transfers is about 23%. After taxes and transfers in the US, it's about 23%. And in Australia, it's 11%. And the editor of the Scientific American that I was writing this piece for said, I think we should take that out of your piece. I said, why? He said, I've got a feeling you're talking about redistribution. And there's no appetite for that in the US, so we should take it out. And I said, no, I, 
because there's no appetite for it in the U.S., we should leave it in. And he said, but then I don't understand it. What are taxes and transfers? I said, well, you know, benefits paid. Benefits paid. He said, I still don't get it. Let me try this out on, this is by email, we're having this correspondence. Let me try this out on you and see if I've got it. He said, what, what you're saying is in Australia, they take money from middle income people and they give it to poor people either as money or as services and benefits. I said, yeah, that's right. He said, some countries really do that? <laughs> yeah, they do. And I think that might be part of the story actually of why things aren't going so well in some countries. But look at this, look at this. This has come part of our monitoring. One, I talk about a gradient all the time, and there is a gradient, but one way of looking at the figures is free school meals. So that's a poverty measure. If you're eligible for free school meals, you're more likely to be in poverty. This is the level of development at the end of reception so look at all pupils, the least deprived, the better the level of development, the greater the proportion of children having a good level of development at age five. Now look at the children on free school meals. Goodness me, it goes the other way. Children on free school meals are doing better in deprived areas than they are in affluent areas. I cycled out to Hackney to talk about growing up in Hackney and the director of education said, we tell ourselves every day that poverty is not destiny. She said, we've broken the link between poverty and poor performance. Here's Hackney. The free school meals people, pupils, are doing the same as the English average. The gap between those on free school meals and all pupils is four percentage points. In Bath and northeast Somerset, it's nearly 30 percentage points. My guess is, if you went to Bath and you said, what are you doing for your poor children? And they'd say, oh, have we got children from poor families in Bath? We didn't realize we had any poverty in Bath. But if you go to Hackney, if you're not focusing on poor children, you're not doing your job because such a high proportion are on free school meals. And why I find this really encouraging is it's not destiny. We want to reduce poverty, which the chancellor could do. But given poverty, services make a difference. And look at these figures from Latin America. The solid line is the percent of children enrolled in preschool. In Cuba, it's nearly 100%. Costa Rica and Chile, it's very high. Paraguay, Dominican Republic, and Colombia, it's low. Now look at reading scores in the sixth grade. High in Cuba, Costa Rica, and Chile, low in Colombia, Dominican Republic, and Paraguay. It just turns out that the longest life expectancy among these countries is in Cuba, Costa Rica, and Chile, and the shortest is in Paraguay, Dominican Republic, and Colombia, and Argentina and Uruguay are somewhere in the middle. That's not proof of causation, but it's consistent with a model of invest in preschool and early child development, improve education, and get better conditions and better health in adulthood. Somebody in the room will explain to me what intergenerational earnings elasticity is. But my understanding <laughs> is uh, what this is doing is looking at the similarity in the earnings of adult children to the earnings of their parents. So if adult children earned exactly the same as their parents, I mean, the, the land. 
and for secular changes, a country with score one on this metric. Phew, John Hills is nodding. <laughs> and if there's no relation between the income of parents and the income of children, a country would score zero. So it means the US and the UK have less social mobility than Denmark, Norway, and Finland. Because in the US and UK, what your parents earn has a much bigger impact on what you earn than it does in Denmark, Norway, and Finland. The problem is that this is correlated with the Gini coefficient the measure of income inequality. I think I learnt this from John Hills, actually. The greater the distance between the rungs of the ladder, the more difficulty there is for the next generation to get from one rung to the next. So income inequality is impacting on the chances of the next generation. Maximising capabilities and control, that's another way of saying education. What we know in country after country, women with more education are more likely to have their babies survive the first year of life than women with no education. So you see big between country differences and in every country, the more education the women have, the lower the infant mortality. And the other thing I think you see here is that the between country differences are less for women with secondary education or higher. So if you're in a country, Mozambique, Chad, Guinea, Nigeria, Rwanda, Niger, Zambia, Malawi, with high infant mortality, but if you have s secondary education or higher, the disadvantage of being in that country is reduced. So education is good for the health of offspring, I showed you in an earlier slide from the US, it's good for women's own health. Arguably, the biggest single predictor of the decline in infant and child mortality globally has been women's education. If the babies all survive, won't we be full of babies? Well, no, actually, because the more education the fewer the children. Education allows women to control their reproduction. And it allows women to control other things. The proportion of women agreeing it's acceptable for a husband to beat his wife if she refused to have sex with him. And you can see these staggeringly high figures, but the more education, the less likely are women to endorse that proposition education can do all of that. And if we come back to educational performance, PISA scores, the program of international student assessment, looking at education as scores on literacy, science, and mathematics. Here's the social gradient in Finland, which always does the best of European countries. Here's the UK a steeper social gradient, and there's the US, a steeper social gradient, and even the top quarter are not doing as well as in Finland. There's China and the Slovak Republic. And that's why I said, I think we need to take a life course perspective, poor quality circumstances for children, poor educational performance. Then we need to look at what's happening in the labor market and income. One of the interesting things, there's been a lot of work to which I've contributed on stress at work. And one of the ways we measure stress at work is imbalance between effort and reward. And if we look at the association between work, stress, and depressive symptoms, it varies by the so-called welfare regime. In liberal regimes, like the UK and the US, the association between effort reward imbalance and depressive symptoms is quite high. Southern Europe, it's a bit lower. Conservative, Germany, Bismarck type regime, and for Scandinavian countries. So everywhere, 
imbalance between effort and reward increases risk of mental illness. But the strength of that assertion, or the magnitude of the difference, varies by the nature of the welfare regime. The other thing, of course, we want work to do is to get people out of poverty. These are Joseph Roundtree figures from 2011-12. The majority of households below the minimum income threshold had at least one adult working, the paler color here. And in those households where at least one adult was working, three quarters of the adults were working. These families are not poor because they're feckless, lazy, don't know what's good for them. They're below the minimum income threshold because they're lowly paid. And that relates to ensuring a healthy standard of living. I have shocking news for you. Welfare spending improves health and reduces inequality. Where did, where did the idea come from that welfare is a bad thing? That all a politician has to do is get up and say welfare and everybody says, yeah, I've got to get the welfare bill done. Why, where do, most people, myself included, think that work is far preferable to being on benefits. And we need to get the incentives right so that it's economically advantageous to work compared with being on benefits. But when you need benefits, we look at country social expenditure and the odds ratios of poor health, the more generous the social expenditure, the lower the inequalities the less the odds of being in poor health. I'll move on. Growing old healthily. One of the big questions is whether we can do anything about health inequalities. If inequalities in health are strongly linked to social and economic inequalities in society, can we reduce inequalities in health, because all country, all, all societies have social and economic inequalities. And the answer seems to be, yeah, we can do a great deal. Look at life expectancy at 50. SE is Sweden, longest life expectancy at 50. ISCD zero to two is primary education, international social classification of education, and ISCD five to six is tertiary university. So Sweden has the longest life expectancy for men at age 50 and a narrow gap. Italy, Norway, Malta, Finland. At the other end, we've got Hungary, Estonia, Bulgaria, Romania, Poland, with lower average and a big gap. The gradient is steeper. And think what I said about infant mortality, the between country differences are much smaller if you've got university education. If you think that health is a matter of personal choice, whatever you do, don't choose to be born in Hungary. Uh, choose Sweden for goodness sake. But if you've made such a stupid choice, at least make sure you get university education because that's like traveling across the Baltic to Sweden. It reduces the between country differences. So the inequalities, the social gradient, the slope of the social gradient in health varies enormously across country. And we take a global perspective. Suicide among Indian farmers. Every half an hour an Indian farmer commits suicide. India is so bloody big that any number sounds big in India, but it's three times the rate for all India. U.S. cotton farmers received $3 billion in subsidies in 2008-9. Removing U.S. subsidies would allow the world price of cotton to rise by between 6 and 14%. Arguably, U.S. cotton subsidies are making life a good deal harder for Indian cotton farmers 
who are on the edge financially and increasing their risk of suicide. I'm a public health doctor. What about ill health prevention? Shouldn't people just look after themselves? If we look at global mean BMI, I shouldn't go on about economists, but I argued with one rational choice theorist from Chicago who said he was obese, he was obese, he was obese because he chose to be obese. What? You get up in the morning saying, I think I'll make myself fatter? And he said, no, he didn't quite mean that. He meant that the joy of a quarter pounder Big Mac um, fries and a large Coke, the pleasure of that was better than the delayed gratification of not getting sick sometime in the future. So it was rational to be obese. I said, well, why has the world got fatter? Is somehow it's got more rational? Or if we look at the US, this is obesity by state. That was 1985, 1997, 2010. What? They've all got feckless and irresponsible, but they've been giving up smoking. They got responsible when it comes to smoking and irresponsible when it comes to eating. Give me a break. We've got to look at the environment, the social causes. I talk about the causes of the causes. Obesity is a cause of avoidable ill health. We've got to look at the causes of obesity and it ain't gonna be solved by simply looking at rational choice models. And we see that obesity follows the social gradient. This is for 19 EU member states. And we're storing up problems for the future, looking at index of multiple deprivation and trends in obesity in children from 2006-7 to 2012-13. The trend is flat in the least deprived and it's upward in the most deprived. So in the future, we'll have increasing inequalities in obesity. Let me finish. I called my book, The Health Gap. I wanted to call it The Organization of Misery. Publishers said, you must be kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I'd been quoting when we launched the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health in Santiago de Chile, I quoted Pablo Neruda, who said, rise up with me against the organization of misery. Well, you can't do that. I said, can I call it the organization of hope? Yeah, a bit abstruse. So I called the first chapter the organization of misery because I document the systematic inequalities within and between countries. But I called the last chapter the organization of hope because there's much to be hopeful about. Look at these between country inequalities from the Americas. There's Peru in the 1950s, life expectancy for men, 43. The US, 66, a 23 year gap in life expectancy. There's Cuba, 57 or 58 compared with 66. Now look what's happened. Peru, wow, it's six years shorter, not 20 something. Cuba's actually slightly longer. Look how much narrower the gap has become. We must not, we should not, we cannot accept the current level of inequalities between countries as somehow a given. If we can get that much change so quickly, we can improve things further. And within countries, look at stunting, low growth in the first year of life in Brazil by family income. There's the social gradient by family income quintiles in 1974-5, 1989, 1996, 2006-7. Wow, they flattened it in no time at all. Wow, that's terrific. We can make a difference really quickly. And the argument for making a difference is a moral one. Thank you.
There we go. Oh dear, I'm an economist. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but not a Chicago school uh, economist. And uh, uh, I, uh, I used to be a uh, official in the uh, finance ministry, the treasury, in, uh, in the UK uh, as, uh, as well. Um, and what I thought I'd do is um, pick up on um, uh, Professor Marmot's um, hope theme and think um, from an applied policy point of view um, through the lens in particular of now being eight years after the Great Recession and some of the changes that have occurred and our understanding of how that recession has impacted. What do I think might be some of the priorities that a government and a society in the UK should adopt to try to make a difference here? And what I've tried to think through is both to think about a strategy which integrates um, tackling, uh, improving population health, tackling inequalities, looking both at the social determinants of health and the healthcare system, because often these are seen as, as very different and, and disconnected, where of course they should be working together. So um, I've just got a, uh, a few slides, um, and the first one here is just to try to think then uh, having seen Professor Marmot's uh, presentation and, and the book, and then looking at what's happened over recent years, if we were trying practically over the next couple of years or so to make a real difference, where might we focus? And I've got three lots of three, as it were. <clears throat> so the first thing around the socioeconomic determinants is to really focus our attention now on the challenge of in-work poverty and job insecurity. So when I was working in the Treasury back in, uh, in, in t the 2000s, um, we wrote uh, a series of publications in the Treasury, Work is the Best Route Out of Poverty. And it really did look like that at the time. I think it's clear that work is really important to tackling poverty, but what is absolutely apparent and exacerbated since the Great Recession is that it might be necessary, but it's not sufficient. And the changing dynamic of our labour market doesn't appear to be a temporary thing and not a UK specific thing. It's a, um, a global thing. So there are lots about how people progress in work, how we restructure social support to people in environments where people are much more likely to be in transitory work, in work which is self-employed, which doesn't have the same structures that uh, traditional workplace provided um, in that. The second area, I think, is the absolute critical importance of housing. Um, in the story of socio-determinants. Uh, now, for adults, housing is really important at the lower end in terms of its cost. For children and families, I think we really need to think about the insecurity of housing. The impact that having to move frequently, which at low income levels is happening more and more, and what that does to relationships with extended families, with communities and support networks, with children's education, which is disrupted. And just to give an anecdote, my children are at a school in North London. My, one of my daughters has just left that school age 11. Out of a class of 30, there were two children at the start who are still there at the end. Yeah? And the only children who are there at the end are the middle class children whose families have tenure. Um, the impact on those children of repeated moves, um, it, it must be uh, profound. The third thing which comes through, I, I hope as I go through this, is absolutely how seminal, I think, mental health issues are I as a source both of inequalities in health and as a really critical part of resilience and tackling some of these issues. And I think just as over the last 20 years we've come to really understand how vitally important the early years are in a child's life chances, and Professor Marmot set that out in a phenomenally compelling uh, way, I think now we're beginning to understand that teenage years are an absolutely critical transition as well. And they're probably most critical in terms of our men the mental resilience. And in the world of work and society that we're talking about in the future, having that mental resilience will be so important either as a driver of inequalities or as a way of overcoming some of those inequalities. So I would argue that in terms of socioeconomic determinants, you'd want to see those three areas really prioritized, and I'll show a few slides in a minute. But then the second area that I've thought about then is primary prevention. 
And I think here, and I'll show a slide, we speak really clearly about um, middle age. You know, we have a situation here, as in most countries, with rising life expectancy, where for economic reasons, we're expecting adults to work for longer. Now, for many adults, that's a fantastic thing. You know, there's lots of evidence, actually, that being economically, intellectually, socially active is very good uh, for you. But a rising retirement age, coupled with inequalities in health with life expectancy, is a real double whammy for people in their, in their middle age. They're then, they've got all of the health problems and income insecurity into middle age. And it's pretty clear that smoking uh, remains obviously a, a critical factor. And I think we've stalled a bit on progress on smoking. And because in, certainly in the UK, we introduced smoking ban sort of 10 years ago. Now in public places, we kind of thought we'd done smoking. And actually, it's pretty clear we haven't. A comprehensive obesity strategy really important and then the third thing again and this comes back to my theme that I think um, we have partly because of the data in a lot of the debate about um, health a big focus on physical risk factors and we need to be much more aware about mental risk factors social isolation is an enormous problem driving poor health outcomes and we need to see it as an issue for primary prevention as important and often compounding in quite obviously complex ways some of the issues around physical risk factors. And then the third area is to think about whether health and the care system um, can really either um, help people to overcome some of those uh, risk factors or exacerbate those. And again, I'm very, gonna focus very much not on traditional acute healthcare services. Um, and I think there are three things that are becoming absolutely apparent as really important in, our, in the ways in which our healthcare system can either compound inequalities or can help to overcome them. One is the shocking inequality in access to mental health services compared to physical health services, and we're just, just at the foothills uh, of waking uh, up to those. But waiting times and lack of access to care for effective known treatments for mental health so, uh, care are, are, are shockingly low. And of course, many people lose touch with the labour market, they lose uh, connections with family and friends when they suffer mental health, and that exacerbates that. The second big driver around many of our inequalities is that if you suffer from a mental health condition, you die much younger than, if, uh, the, than the general population, but typically not directly from the mental health condition, but actually from four poor physical health from other chronic conditions. And we have very poor uh, outcomes for on physical health services for people with mental health problems. We do not look at people holistically and we don't tackle those issues and we need to get much better at that. And then the final thing, uh, particularly around uh, older people, is access to social care services, which are being cut and consigning many older people to lives of silent uh, misery. And across all of these areas, we really need to think um, about women's health. Is actually, certainly in the UK, we've um, made less progress, actually, I think, on women's health than we have on men's health over uh, recent years. And we need to think family as a unit. And in health, too often, we, we d we're not very good at thinking about that as a unit. So why those things? And a couple of things just to, to focus on how um, things seem to look in terms of some of our key economic and, and, and social determinants post the, the general recession. So this is a chart that comes from the Institute of Fiscal Studies, and they've looked at um, households uh, below um, average earnings. And what you see um, since, uh, uh, um, particularly sharply, I think, since 2008, is that actually incomes for pensioners have done really uh, rather well. We obviously have a big reduction overall for a period as the Great Recession came in in that middle grey line and started to tick up. But it's in work groups that have, have really uh, struggled. And this is looking at median household income be before housing costs. When I overlay then the um, inequalities position and look at um, both before and after housing costs, what you see actually here, and this is uh, looking um, at the change up to 13 and 14 since the, the, the Great Recession, 
is that, that actually, oddly, as is often the case in these recessions, the recession, if you don't think about housing costs, had, had actually slightly reduced inequality. But the impact of housing costs has been very profound on that pattern. So low interest rates mean that people who are owner-occupied have done comparatively well, but we've seen rents rising sharply for people on lower income who are more likely in, to be both in private rented and, and socially rented. So that's both the mix of private sector and government policies in relation to rent. And actually, therefore, the position of, of, of lower income groups has been worse. So actually, the primary income distribution matters. This points again to Professor Malmut points that over and above that, societies have choices. I would argue really that for the UK, what we choose to do about housing and housing costs for lower income people over the next few years could make a massive difference, both directly in terms of people's income and indirectly in terms of family stability and structure, stress and mental health, leaving aside the impact of poor housing generally. The next thing is to think about, and this is uh, Richard Layard's fantastic uh, uh, work with, with colleagues, again, looking at what are the Im influence, childhood influences on adult life satisfaction. And this, I think, is using the 1970 birth cohort study and looking at life satisfaction at 34. And what you see again is education attainment, test performance matters, behavior matters, emotional health, emotional well-being has the most enormous uh, impact. I've got an extra decimal. Um, I've got my decimals there. I've got an extra one decimal, sorry about that. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it should be 0.17, sorry. Um, and, and so um, you know, taking a, making sure, not just that our young people are well equipped with good exam results, but actually that they have the emotional resilience it is, is fundamental. And we need to pay much more attention to that. And then um, the life expectancy point, the healthy life expectancy point, is really I important. Across um, the EU for men and women, we're obviously doing much better at life expectancy than healthy life expectancy. And the thing that worries me is the age 65 because of this issue about rising retirement age and how rising retirement age will potentially have a very negative impact if we can't deal with the burden of chronic disease both physical and mental, in, men, in middle age for lower income uh, people. And then the point I made about smoking and how far that has plateaued, particularly for men, and we need to really reinvigorate that. And then the final point I'll make about how cuts to public services can make things worse. This is um, data from the Health Survey for England, which is looking at um, people who need help with activities of daily uh, living and it uh, stratifies both men and women in the different income groups, highest income group, middle income group and lowest. And the red uh, circles are people who need help. And help can come from state services, from paid for privately or from friends and family. And the uh, green crosses show you the receipt of help. And what I've done is show the change from the previous year. So this is in 2013. And what you see is that obviously lower income men and women need more help, but the gap between them receive, needing help and receiving help is largest for lower income people and it is growing. Yeah? So, um, and, and these are people then who are stuck in their home it, 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 in, uh, it, in silent misery. So there are choices and things that, that, that we could uh, do. Um, uh, and then to make, just to reinforce the point about, uh, ab about uh, women, you know, it is really important, obviously, um, the UK, if I look at a UK perspective here, actually does quite well comparatively for men, but a actually our performance for women is poor. So any strategy needs to really understand why we are making less progress for women as well. Thank you. And so those are some observations. Thank you. Yeah, I guess we'll only need to come for five minutes, won't we? Shall we get some some hydrogen screen on there?
Thank you. Good morning. Um, it's a real pleasure to respond to Michael again. Um, we, did this, we did this recently, and I noticed that we are together on Amazon as well. So anybody who goes to Amazon and looks for your book, um, it's suggested to them that they could buy ours as well. And if you go, <laughs> if you go and look for, for ours, it's suggested that they could buy yours as well. <laughs> so clearly somebody thinks there's some synergy between our perspectives. Um, we're not, of course, the only people writing about health inequalities and the causes of them. And I did want to draw your attention to two other new books. One is from Ted Schreck and Claire Bambra called How Politics Makes Us Sick, Neoliberal Epidemics. And the other is um, an edited collection of writings, Critical Perspectives on Health Inequalities. And really, um, what Michael's saying, what um, my research is about what Ted and Claire and Kat Smith and all of the other people working on health inequalities research in the UK and internationally is we know the causes. We know the determinants of poor health. We know the determinants of inequalities in health. And they're not to do with health care and they're very little to do with individual behaviours. So how do we sort of shift um, our understanding, our academic research and translate it into policy, politics, and practice. And I, I'm going to be optimistic today. I'm not optimistic about Brexit, but I am optimistic about some other things. And one of those things is that we're in a completely new world, really. Um, our economics has been dominated by the Chicago School neoliberal approach for a long time. My first job was at the University of Chicago, so I'm a Chicago School epidemiologist. Um, <laughs> But we're living in a post-global financial crisis world where lots of people are calling for new approaches to thinking about what our economy is for, you know, who is it for, what should be the goals of it. People really thinking about if we have to do capitalism differently. And it's not just people in the health world, of course. There are Nobel Prize winning economists writing about the impact of inequality on economic stability and economic growth. There are people talking about needing a post-GDP world, people talking about putting well-being as the focus of societal policies and economic policies, that that should be our aim rather than GDP per capita. So there's kind of a, a ferment at the moment and perhaps a sense that we're moving towards something different that actually has more hope for improving population health in the rich world and the developing world and reducing inequalities between us. We really have got to the end of what economic growth can do for us in the rich world. Economic growth has been you know, going up over the past sort of half century. Happiness hasn't improved. Health inequalities hasn't improved. And so some of us are a bit sort of tired of waiting um, for the skeleton in the boat. Some people are very tired of waiting, and so we see a populist movement. Um, the Occupy movement reflected that perfectly, of people wanting a different world, people wanting fewer inequalities. The Occupy movement was incredibly powerful, got huge amounts of media attention, but they didn't really know what they wanted. They didn't really have that agenda of an alternative, and so it's not enough just to sort of call for something different unless you know what that different looks like. Michael mentioned um, that his editor told him, or the editor of Scientific American told him, that Americans have no appetite for redistribution. That editor was wrong. Um, a Harvard business professor and a behavioral economist did a survey of Americans and asked them how they thought wealth is distributed in the United States. That's the um, top line. Um, that's the, act the top bars are the actual distribution of wealth where 20 the top 20% have 80% of the wealth. The middle line is what Americans think it is. They think that the top 20% have just under 60%. But when they were asked what they would like it to be like, they actually thought that the top 20% should probably only have about 30%. And unbeknownst to them, they expressed a preference for what is actually Sweden's income distribution. 92% picked a more equal distribution than the one that they have. 
And that was regardless of whether they were Democrat or Republican, black or white, male or female, rich or poor, highly educated or not. There was virtually no difference. So the appetite is there. And the evidence base keeps growing. Um, we recently published, Richard Wilkinson and I, a causal review of the income inequality and health literature. There's well over 300 papers documenting that link. And we get sent new papers all the time. I can tell you there are some very exciting papers in the pipeline showing how macroeconomic policy affects people's levels of mental distress in Britain. But this is from the most recent UNICEF um, report on child well-being. Michael showed you some data earlier. Once again, they're showing that inequality is related to child well-being, lower levels of well-being in the more unequal countries, and much higher in the more equal ones, the Scandinavian countries, etc. But I think more interestingly, we took that recent data, that report on um, child well-being in 2013, and we looked at whether child well-being had improved since the first time UNICEF did that in 2007 and looked at it in, in relation to changes in income inequality over the, over the decade. And countries that had a slight improvement in their inequality had a larger increase in their child well-being. And notice Sweden at the bottom left, which has the most rapidly growing inequality among the OECD countries and has seen its levels of child well-being decline and indeed its levels of educational attainment of children. They have plummeted too. So how do we act and where do we act? I think we can act at three levels. I think we can do things locally to reduce health inequalities and at Michael's instigation, the British Academy, Academy did a project on what can be done to reduce health inequalities and I was on the steering committee for that and we decided to focus on what local authorities could do. Public health in England has recently moved out of the National Health Service back to local authorities where I think it truly belongs. Um, and this report suggests things that local authorities can do that are within their remit to reduce health inequalities. Lower speed limits, promoting the living wage, um, various things. So I think there's a lot we can do locally. Um, and I think there's a lot going on. There have been about 15 at least fairness commissions in the UK where local authorities have convened a commission to say what can we do about reducing inequality in our areas and they've all had a focus on health inequality as well. They have all called for the living wage. And in my own city, city of York, the council not, not only pays all of its employees the living wage, it requires that any company that contracts with them or from whom they procure anything they have to pay the living wage as well. And so that spreads throughout the local economy and becomes the norm. Internationally, world leaders are talking about inequality. The Pope, Barack Obama, even the director of the International Monetary Fund, all recognizing that this is a problem. And rhetoric is great, but it's only a first step. The next step is to have goals and targets, and now we've got them. The um, sustainable Development Goals, agreed at the end of last year by 193 countries, is the first time the world has had a framework for reducing poverty, hunger, improving health, reducing inequalities, goal number 10, um, that applies to the whole world, unlike the Millennium Development Goals, which really only applied to poor countries. So now we need to make sure that we meet those goals by 2030. And we just can't do it without international cooperation. We just can't do it without the kind of collaboration that Michael was talking about. Um, I'm speaking to the European Parliament next week to two committees, the Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs and the Committee on Social Policy or something like that, who are having a joint meeting to hear about the impact of inequality on society, on health and well-being. Next year, I might not be asked to do that kind of thing because we might not be at that table and might not be having any input into those kinds of cooperative processes that are so important for preserving our health and well-being and moving forward. So I'm afraid I haven't given the kind of academic response that perhaps John intended when he asked me to do this. And it, um, but Michael, you were more political than usual, I thought, today. So, so we're, all, we're sort of on a Brexit kind of um, galvanized 
um, upswing of political campaigning. If you'd like to um, know more about the impact of income inequality, in particular on health and well-being and on health inequalities, um, do visit the Equality Trust's website. It's www.equalitytrust.org.uk. There's lots of resources there, um, summaries of research, lots of um, slides that you can download, um, that kind of thing. Um, and I hope you'll, you'll visit us there if you have any interest um, in finding out more. But really, it is all about all of us banging on about it all of the time and demanding it until we start to get some action. And so it's everybody in this room. You all count. How you vote counts, whether you write to your politicians counts. Everything that you can do to push a health inequalities reduction agenda will actually benefit all of us and improve the quality of life for all of us. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. We have a couple of minutes for questions, um, so hopefully it won't take up too much of the, the break. Was there any uh, questions that we'd like to pose to our great speakers? So thank you. There's a microphone just coming down. Uh, thank you, David Stace from the US. Uh, if inequality is the issue, redistribution is often poised as the solution. And I think that generally we have three different options. We can give people cash, we can give them services, or we can give them an opportunities. And under conditions of austerity, which is the most plausible and productive? Uh, well, I mean, th the answer is all three. Um, and, but I don't accept the premise under conditions of austerity. Uh, my understanding is, uh, and I've heard several economists say this, where mainstream economics is, is against austerity. It's not the right uh, response to the global financial crisis, it was the wrong response. So your initial premise under conditions of austerity, which has become the excuse for cutting all three of those, for reducing people's income. I, um, I don't know where housing fits in those three, but I think um, the housing thing is absolutely crucial. But it's become an excuse for reducing income, for reducing services and reducing opportunities. So I don't accept the original premise. Yeah. Can, can I say one thing here which I think is really important? If you look at the long-term economics to sustainability, the challenge for most developed nations is how to reinvigorate productivity. Yeah? So we've had eight years now of low productivity, well, non-existent productivity uh, growth. And we, can't uh, we, will, uh, we need to tackle that productivity problem and the only way we will do really is obviously by ensuring that people have the skills and the capabilities to um, to, to 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 work more more e effectively and, and and so education for example here it's not a kind of um, there's a choice between doing well economically and doing well socially in fact the um, the, the social goals here and the economic goals both have education you know education at, at the heart and a high skills skilled well motivated well engaged uh, labor market at its heart and interestingly the um, the UK policy to introduce what they're calling a living wage which is just a, 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 a higher minimum wage one of the things that actually um, may well be one of the most exciting things about that is that it stimulates higher productivity because it takes away from many sectors of the economy the opportunity just to go for a very skill, low skilled, low wage way, way of, of competing. So I, I, I think it, it, there are, that we need to get beyond the, these are competing agendas to see that much, much more that there is a real synergistic ag agenda here. Um, I would also argue with the idea that redistribution is the only way to reduce income inequality. There are societies that achieve much greater equality than either we have in the UK or, or the US by having smaller income differences before taxes and not relying on redistribution um, 
to achieve greater equality. And in fact, in the US, Vermont and New Hampshire are rather like that, with um, New Hampshire looking a bit like Japan and having smaller income differences before taxes, and Vermont looking a bit more like Sweden and doing more redistribution. But because both of those states achieve a high level of equality relative to other states, they have lower levels of health and social problems. So there are other options, and at the moment we are thinking and writing a lot about economic democracy as a mechanism for reducing income differences in the workplace. The more democracy you have, the less likely you are to have the runaway salaries and bonus culture at the top, and the more likely you are to pay lower paid workers properly. Thank you. Thank you for the question. We have um, to kind of wrap up, but just to remind you that um, Michael will be signing books just outside, and there'll be lots of opportunities to um, perhaps uh, grab our speakers over coffee now. And thank you. If you join me again, thanking them for their great presentations. Thank you.